these elephants aren't part of a circus act, and they don't work for peanuts. They're an important part of an important industry. We'll see what they do and how they do it today on part two of Discovery Goes to Thailand. Discovery 67, the award-winning program for young people with Bill Owen and Virginia Gibson. Hi, welcome to Discovery. Last week, we were in southern Thailand to see what life is like for the people who live in that beautiful and prosperous country of Southeast Asia. We visited the family of Suwon Putachan, who live along a canal just outside of Bangkok. We met Tanyu and Tipawan and saw how they go to school in a dugout canoe much as you might take the school bus at home. Their school, like most of the schools in southern Thailand, is in a Buddhist Wat, and we found out how young Thai children are exposed to their country's gentle and serene religion at an early age. Many of the young monks didn't look too much older than Tanyu and Tipawan themselves. We also took a trip with Tanyu and Tipawan and their father and brother to Bangkok's famous floating market, where you can buy anything from fried bananas to curry chicken to jelly deals. As far as Tanyu and Tipawan were concerned, though, their favorite was still coconut ice cream. Now we've come to another part of Thailand, to the northern part of the country, to find out what life is like in the land of trained elephants and teak forests. Today we've come to the province of Lampong in northern Thailand to tell the story of two young families and an international organization of people who care what happens to children and their parents. One family lives here in this rented house by the side of the road that stretches between the town of Lampong and the village of Munga. You know, Bill, this part of Thailand is considerably different from what we saw last week in Bangkok. Here the people don't depend on rice or fruit or vegetables for their livelihood. Here the forest is important, the huge teak trees, and the elephants who do much of the work. You see elephants everywhere here. They're as much a part of the scene as the trees or the houses or the dusty roads. But it still takes people, Ginny. People like Neret and his wife Urai, who live in that house at the side of the road with their two-month-old baby. They've only been married a year, and this is their first home. The baby's name is Taperat, which in the Thai language means wood sprite, an appropriate name for a baby who lives at the edge of the teak forest. The other family, who are part of our story, actually live within the forest in a lumber camp. This is Moon. He's not quite as fortunate as Naret. Because of the primitive living conditions in the lumber camp, his wife Mao and their two-and-a-half-year-old daughter can visit him for only a few days at a time. But no matter how they live, both Naret and Moon know that their lives are far better today than they were a few years ago because of an international organization that means much to the people of Thailand. That organization of people who are concerned about children and their future is UNICEF, the United Nations Children's Fund. It has cooperated with the government of Thailand to build and operate this rural health center in the village of Mungao. There's Mr. Chon Sok. He's the highly trained health officer who lives in a house just behind the center, close to his work. And there's Mrs. Somai, the center's expert on child care who makes her rounds on a bicycle provided by UNICEF. But if it weren't for the vast forest around them, neither Neret nor Moon, nor their families, nor even the health center would be situated near the Thai town of Lampong. For that matter, there might not even be a town. Next to the growing of rice, teak is Thailand's most important industry. Thousands of Thais, like Neret and Moon, depend upon it for their daily existence. They also depend upon the highly trained elephants who have learned to do work that no machine has been able to duplicate.
Getting the valuable logs out of the almost impenetrable forest requires a rare kind of precision and teamwork. A close working relationship between the powerful elephants and their skilled handlers were able to make the great animals execute the most difficult maneuvers. Eventually, the heavy logs are brought to a sawmill to be cut into boards and beams that will make the tables, cabinets, desks, and chairs that will find their way into homes as far away as Japan, Australia, England, the United States, and Canada. But whether the end product is shipped to far off places or used right here, it still requires the skilled work of trained men intelligent elephants, and dedicated people like Mrs. Somai, who have helped make the jungle a better place in which to live, even if they've had to do it on a bicycle. But the story really begins with another bicycle. It's Neret's bicycle, and the time is very early in the morning when he leaves Urai and their son before 6 a.m. in order to meet the demands of the elephant's work schedule. Neret's a tractor driver. His job, to haul the teak logs over rough terrain once they've been pulled from the forest by the elephants. Moon's job, unlike Neret's, requires that he be at work even before dawn. Each morning before the sky lightens, Moon must go into the forest to find the elephant that is his special charge. The reason for this is that during the night hours, work elephants are released to fend for themselves, finding bamboo and banana leaves to feed on. And so every morning, there is the procession, joined by Moon and his elephant, men and their animals coming to put in a full, hard day of work. While Moon works at the lumber camp, his wife Mao is also hard at work. Mao has come a long way in ancient buses, traveling over bumpy roads to be with her husband for a week or so. It isn't easy, but it's worth it to Mao to keep her family together. Mao met Moon five years ago when he was working at a teak forest near her home in Prey Province, some 80 difficult miles from here. Since then, Mao has been coming and going back and forth from their home in Prey as Moon follows his work with his elephant from one teak forest to another. But despite the difficulties his work forces on his family, this is the work Moon knows, the work for which he has been trained. How do a man and his beast work so harmoniously at a job that can also be highly dangerous? We'll find out in just a minute. Deep in the teak forests of Thailand, the most common sound you hear is the power saw biting into the hard wood. It's exacting, highly specialized work, making the right cut in the tree at the right spot so it will fall in the right place, endangering neither man nor animal nor other trees. Next, the branches are cut off so that only the thick, heavy trunk is left. Now that the tree is down, how do you get it out of the thick teak forest? That's where the elephants come in. This fallen tree is the last of a specified licensed quota in this district. It'll be the responsibility of Moon and Gao Tai Mai and their elephant, Boon Singh. First, the elephant is placed into position with his back to the log. Next, a heavy chain is placed around the log. Then, when the chain is secured, the elephant begins to drag the log out of the forest and into a clearing. 
another valuable log is ready for the sawmill. But the preparations for both the men and the elephants started many hours before. It all begins in the early morning when the elephants are brought in from a night in the forest. The elephant, who is Moon's special responsibility, is named Boon Singh, which means virtue of a lion. Every elephant working in the Thai teak industry has two men who work with him. One works on the ground. He's called a Quantine. Moon is a Quantine. He rides his elephant only before the day's work and after it. Thai work elephants are treated in many ways like human workers. They work seven hours a day, they get summer vacations, and they retire at the age of 60. Preparing an elephant for the day's work involves a set routine. Having brought Boon Singh from the forest, Moon now prepares to get off the elephant. It's the task of the Quang Kor, in this case, Moon's partner, Kao Tai Mai, to ride the elephant's head while it works. Boon Singh is trained to help the Quantine and Quang Kor dismount and mount onto his head. At a verbal signal, the animal shifts his weight to his left foot, then bends his right knee, providing a perfect portable and collapsible stepladder. Once astride the animal, the Quancor goes about arranging the complicated saddle which the elephant wears to protect him from the chains which he would drag in his work. The saddle's made of wood and woven tree bark. It's made by hand by the Quantine and Quancor during the hot summer months when the elephant is on vacation. While the Quancor is busy arranging the saddle, Moon fastens the last straps into place. Both men and beast are now ready for the hard work ahead. A trained elephant knows his job well, but it still requires the Quantine and the Quancor to guide him to the proper trees and tell him what to do. The Quantine on the ground and the Quancor on his head never leave him while he's at work. The elephant is trained to respond to two sets of commands, orders he can hear and orders he can feel. The barefooted Quancor sits on the elephant's head and with his feet, knees, and legs tells the animal whether he wants him to go forward, backward, left or right, faster or slower, and start or stop. At the same time, there are verbal commands. And an elephant may have to know his commands in several dialects, so different that they are virtually separate languages, depending on whether the Quancors grew up in the northern, central, or southern parts of Thailand. Even the trees that haven't fallen are handled by the elephants who simply push them over on command. And if the tree won't topple the first time around, the patient and persistent elephant simply tries and tries again. Physical characteristics of an elephant also make it perfectly adapted for piling the logs. In addition to its tremendous strength and endurance, the elephant uses its trunk to secure a firm grasp on the log, while at the same time using its tusks as a convenient tray to prevent the log from falling. So far, men have been unable to perfect a machine which can haul felled trees out of the thick forests of northern Thailand better than an elephant can. And so the teak forests of Thailand remain the elephant's domain. It's only at the forest's edge that machines, tractors, can take over. And this is where Nerette's job begins, hauling the teak logs the rest of the way to the sawmill. As Nerette goes about his work, it is made much easier by knowing that even though his wife and baby live with him in an area once beset by disease and pestilence, they are now safe. 
This is their home on the edge of the vast dark teak forest. But it's a home that has been made secure and livable. We'll find out how in just a minute. The Elephant's Day ends back at the lumber camp. The animals are brought here where their harnesses and saddles are removed and hung up to dry. It's the end of the elephant's work day, but not the end of Moon's. As a quantine, he's responsible for looking after Boon Singh through the rest of the daylight hours in the forest when the elephant is let loose to forage for the endless supply of leaves and twigs on which he lives. It's early afternoon, and despite the heat, life along the Lampong Mungao Road continues. Now, Rhett is still at work on the tractor, hauling logs to the sawmill. And for his wife, Urai, there is also work. An important part of it is going to the community well for drinking water. This well, together with rainwater that is caught in giant jars, supplies Urai and her neighbors with the water their families need for drinking, cooking, and washing. Their family's health depends on the purity of this water. To make sure that the water is pure is just one of the many jobs at the health center's Mr. Chan Sok. Three and sometimes four times a week, he visits all of the wells in the district and looks for signs of possible contamination. At least once a week, Mr. Chan Sok takes a sample of the well water for chemical analysis. While the health officer makes sure that the water supply is usable, Mrs. Somai, the midwife, makes her rounds among the young mothers of the village. Here she answers many questions about child care. Then when it's time for the baby to have a complete checkup, Urai knows that this too is available. About once a month, she boards the bus that runs down the Lampang Mungao Road, passing through the countryside she has gotten to know so well. It's her home now, the place where her husband works and where her baby is growing up. Late morning is a time of peak activity for the health center at Mungao. Urai will join the other mothers who have brought their infants to the clinic. The work of the government and UNICEF health centers in Thailand is centered upon mothers and children, both before and after the arrival of the babies. Here the baby is weighed and examined, and the mother is given a report on its progress. Fifteen years ago, before UNICEF's arrival in Thailand, there were only 10 health centers in all of Lampang province. Now there are 33. But no one here pauses to think much about the improvements. The clinic is part of their lives now, and it's no more unusual than the work their husbands and sons are doing in the teak forest. When Naret comes bicycling back up the Mungao Road, Urai is there to greet him. Twelve years ago, before the work of UNICEF had taken hold in the area, Four of her brothers and sisters died of malaria. But now, those days are past. They and their children can look forward to full productive lives, thanks to an international organization, UNICEF, and to the people as far away as Akron or San Francisco or Chicago, 
who have contributed pennies, nickels, and dimes to its support. We'll be back in just a minute. We hope you've enjoyed Discovery's visit to Northern Thailand. Next week, we'll be back in the United States at Mesa Verde National Park, Colorado, when Discovery visits the Stone Age Americans. We'll meet an American girl named Esther, who lived in Colorado before Columbus discovered America. Be with us next week. Bye-bye. Bye. The Discovery Production Unit's foreign transportation arrangements provided by Alitalia Airlines. This has been a Jules Power production in association with ABC News and Public Affairs.